I am Lucas Mack, and I'm on a mission to see the hurting get healed and the healed go out and heal others in order for all of us to experience the true love and light we desire. This podcast is me sharing my journey with you so you don't feel alone in your journey. Welcome to the Golden Rule Revolution. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another episode of the Golden Rule Revolution. I'm Lucas Mack. Thank you for joining today. Buckle up because you're in for quite a treat um, and quite a story with my guest, Trevor Carney. So I'll explain how I met Trevor when the episode begins here. Um, But Trevor tells an incredible story. He's an incredible guy. His awakening, um, we go... I would say we go wide and we're going to do another episode where we're going to go incredibly deep, but this is going to set the framework um, and you're going to learn about behind the scenes of the elite and Trevor's perspective of it. Um, He was involved with the show Pimp My Ride for years, West Coast Customs, um, a lot of different different, um, access points he had to the elite and... um, it's just an incredible story. And he had a spiritual awakening, which at the very end of the episode we get, or not yeah, towards the end, we start talking about that. And I think it's incredibly beautiful. There's a lot of synchronicity in the story. So I think you're going to really enjoy it. Um, one of the things I uh, want to make sure that I talk about, like I said, in last episode, we have a new show sponsor and I'm really happy about that. Jamie Vezina uh, with Sound Soul Studio. She has an online studio a yoga and wellness studio where music meets the mat to align your mind, body, and soul with the power of movement. The goal of Sound Soul Studio is to offer fun and engaging classes that fit into the nooks, crannies, and budgets of our lives. Yoga and fusion classes utilize dynamic movement to build strength and flexibility. Dynamic movement is at the core of everything that they do at Sound Soul Studio. Sound Soul Studio. <laughs> Their yoga classes are great for for beginners and experienced yogis alike, and their classes feature creative movements to set set to music for a unique experience compared to your traditional classes. Need a moment to unwind, sit down and relax with one of the quick meditations to find balance throughout the day. Take time for yourself and start your free seven-day trial and just $9 per month when your trial ends. And here's the great thing. You can use code GOLDEN. That's code GOLDEN, G-O-L-D-E-N, for 30% off your first month. Head to soundstudio.com. Head to soundsoulstudio.com and subscribe today. Thank you, Jamie, again for sponsoring the show. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks for, (laughs) as I'm reading that live uh, with no edits, uh, thank you for going and checking them out and supporting Jamie. All right, brothers and sisters, here we are, Trevor Carney. This is going to be part one of um, probably we're going to do multiple more than two episodes, but this is definitely an incredible episode with really wild story. Um, After this episode, you're going to want to Google or during you could pause and Google Trevor Carney and um, the Ferrari crash. And he's going to talk about it in this episode. So enjoy. All right, my brothers and sisters. So as I just shared, I have an amazing an incredibly fascinating guest today, a brother of mine who we connected um, connected online pretty recently, and then we talked, and it was just like like two two souls connected to each other. And and uh, brother Trevor Trevor Carney, thank you for coming on, man, and and uh, welcome welcome to the Golden Rule Revolution. Thank you. It's it's nice to be a, to be a part of this new revolution that's beginning to form in front of our eyes. We're we're coming into high gear now and everything, bro. It's it is um, it's exciting. It's exhilarating. It's all these things, you know. As we're watching all these systems crumble, but people still like holding on to them. Like that's got to be true. If it's if it's not true, what does that mean about me? And that's I think the biggest question that is going to be faced. If these things are lies, what does it mean about me? Right? Where does it leave me? Where does it leave me? 
of, and, and I, when I, I attempted suicide at the age of 20, and that's when everything changed for me because I, I had to sit with not dying, trying to die and not dying. And then sitting and realizing what if every single thing that I believe to be true is a lie? Yeah. What wow. if every everything what if blue is red what if red is gray what i mean what if why how do i know if i didn't experience it first person this is why i'm so excited to have you on and talk about your story and the thing because if i didn't experience it first person then how do we really know and so Mm -hmm. people that go through things first person that can share from not only experience but an authentic place versus like well i learned this from from who and who did they learn it from and who did they learn it from? How long has this game of telephone been going on generation after generation, one fallen head to another. Yeah. And we're all awakening to say, what is the truth? Where am I in truth? Where is truth in me? You know, like all this stuff. So I'm just happy to have you on, bro. Where did, where did the lies begin? Yeah. Where did the lies begin? That's right. Um, you, you like this one quote of mine and you know, it's funny. You're the first person that's ever told me they liked it. Cause usually people get pissed at it. That 99% of the truth is hundred percent a lie. Factual. That's factual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dude. So tell, tell us about your story. I mean, go in as much as you want to share. You feel comfortable sharing. I think everyone listening listen to this brother share from a first person experience of things that most people see on TV or read about, but share your story, brother, even where you, when you grew up and, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. We should probably start from the, from the beginning. So I'm originally from Ireland. Uh, I was born in Dublin, 1980. I was, uh, my father was a businessman. He was an up and coming businessman in Dublin. So we had multiple businesses he was under a lot of stress and uh, he died when he was 40. I was four. So my mom had to take over our businesses. I had two brothers. So she had three boys to rear. We were all fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. My brother has three boys. That's a lot yeah. of boys. That's a lot it of boys. was. Yeah, it was crazy. So um, then I started school and I hated school. Didn't like being told what to do. Yeah. And also was noticing that these people couldn't answer any questions that I was trying to, you know, get the answers for. So I fought them the whole way through school and um, to begin with. And then when I was eight, they put me into boarding school. Mm. And this was a boarding school run by nuns. It was a Catholic church, you know, connected to the Vatican yeah. boarding school. Yeah. And, uh, you know, life changed very fast when I got there because all of a sudden I was on my own and you know, there was other kids there, they were on their own, but we were all together. And then we had the nuns over us, you know, looking after us and beating the shit out of you. (laughs) They were, yeah, they were, they were beating the shit out of us. Yeah. And they used to like, this is in 1988 and they used to, um, you know, they used to tell us stuff like it, this was 10 years ago and all this shit. So what were they doing to the kids 10 years beforehand? Yeah. yeah. You know, if they were punching me as a, like punching me and hitting me with a meter stick yeah. and putting me in timeout for st- stupid things. And they were just generally horrible to us. And they spoke down to us at all times. We had to be super polite in that place. You know, it was yes, sister, no sister. And, if you if you looked at them sideways, they just grab you by the ear, pull you aside, and just like go to town on you, you know. Bro, I so I grew up in a Catholic family. I'll just leave it at that. But my dad yeah. would tell me stories that they would have to put their fingers under the desk lids would lift up, and they'd have to put their fingers on the desk, and the nuns would slam slam it on their fingers. Because, because Jesus loves you. <laughs> he loves you that much. That he sent some crazy old lady that's dressed yeah. up a fucking black yeah. ghost right. to come and teach you, right? So this these these crazy old, you know, violent maniacs are going to teach you how to survive in the world. They kind of toughen you up to the world, right? They yeah. get you ready for that much. Yeah. And then the the constant like bringing up Jesus and his blood and all these things. It was just all very. Um, 
it was surreal to start with how if you loved somebody so much that you would want to drink his blood during a mass and eat his body, you know, with this piece of bread that they're giving you. And then we were saying, uh, I was telling you before we went online that we used to have to say the rosary every day, which is 10 Hail Marys and an Our Father. And you say them back to back different decades. And we used to do that for like an hour and a half every day. And one day um, I got ta- caught talking. I used to be talking to my friends, you know, <laughs> while we were doing it. And the main nun, her name was Sister Jarlett, right? She was she was a triple Dan black belt heavyweight champion <laughs> of the Catholic Church, right? And she uh, right, disputed, you know? yeah, yeah. And she used to sit at the back of the room and play the organ, right? So she'd be playing all these songs as the on the organ as the kids are saying "Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee." Like so, she had this whole thing going on. It must be she must have loved it, right? And she catches me talking, stops everything, and she said, "Trevor, stand up." So I stood up. She said, "What were you talking about?" <laughs> and I said, uh, "I was talking about Jesus." And she said, "Oh, okay." She said, "What were you saying about Jesus?" And I said, well, Jesus died for our sins, right? And he's our king. And she said, yes, yes. And I said, and that's him up on the wall, nailed to a cross. And she said, yes. And I said, so if I died tomorrow, would you, would you, and and I got hit by a car, would you have a picture of a car hitting me? Mm. And that's how you would remember me. Mm. And she jumped up out out of the seat and she started walking up after me. And as she was coming, I said, uh, and why are you drinking his blood? Mm. You're drinking his blood like in mass, you know? Yeah. She grabbed me by the ear and she pulled me out by the ear and took me outside, just beat me down the hall. And then later that evening, they moved me into a room on my own. Mm. They took me from the dormitory where all the rest of the kids were and put me in a room on my own. And I, I remember I used to sit on this, the windowsill of this, room and i used to look up at the the moon at night and just fantasize about my mom coming and picking me up and taking me home and kicking one of these nuns in the balls don't you ever touch my child <laughs> literally <laughs> literally you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh that never happened and they were tough enough to go the 12 rounds with me and they kept me until uh you know i finished that grade of school and then i went into secondary school after that wow. And uh, I fought them to the end, though, right? They never broke me. And my mom often jokes with me and she says, even those nuns couldn't break you. And I was like, I know. I I left there and then I went on to secondary school, you know, high school. And I stayed in school for like, I stayed in school till I was about 15. Mm. I couldn't do it. I just wasn't able for it. And I had different teachers in that school. It wasn't just one every day. And I just got into it with all of them. I loved the people in school. I got along with everybody. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I made it my mission to get kicked out of school. So mm. I just kept at them and at them and at them every day until they'd kick me out or I would force them to suspend me. And then I'd just go home and I'd take my dirt bike out and I'd just go drive around the fields on my dirt bike. I loved it. And then eventually, you know, all the meetings that were called between my mom and counselors and all these people and the head, the head teachers, uh, they decided that they'd let me leave school. I just wanted to become a mechanic. That's all I wanted. Mm. So, but I was too young to become a mechanic. Um, I had to be 16 for that. So I had a year that I had to wait. And uh, in the middle of that, I ended up landing myself a job in a quarry driving a dump truck. Like like a Tonka truck, like thirty wow. ton dump truck is huge, right? I was I was only fifteen, so all day every day I was driving this dump truck from a crusher where they take stone, put it into the back of the the dumper, and then I would dump that into a machine and it would crush it all up into smaller pieces, wow. be fed into a, a tarmacadam plant where they make asphalt for the roads. So I do this all day every day, drive up and down this like. Not five years before that, I was playing with Tonka toys, you know. Now I was driving them. That's awesome. Yeah, that that was one of my favorite jobs everywhere. At any time, I, I tell people about that all the time. I loved it. Mm-hmm. And then um, I left there, and then I got into uh, I got an apprentice uh, apprenticeship as a mechanic, mm. a truck mechanic. 
So I went and I was doing that. I did that for about three years. I wasn't going to finish my apprenticeship because I never finish any of these things because they're we're all made up anyway. It's like, if you know how to do it, you can do it. I don't need your piece of paper. Yeah. So I left there and um, I had a trust that was left to me for when my dad died. So when I approached 18, I had some money. And um, so I got my money and I start buying nice cars and things. And I was playing around with cars. And then I decided to um, go to Los Angeles. I was into music at the time and I wanted to I wanted to get into music. So mm. I came to Los Angeles and um, within a week of getting there, I met um, a pair of producers, uh, TV producers. They were twins, uh, Howard and Austin. And Howard and Austin shot, um, they shot TV shows and commercials and things like that. But they wanted to get into the news. They mm. wanted to shoot news stories. So I became really close with these guys. And I ended up moving into the same uh, the same apartment building as them in Marina Del Rey, right, in California. It's a beautiful place. And every night we used to get down to the jacuzzi and we would sit in the jacuzzi and other people there. There was lots of celebrities used to stay there. Hayden Panettiere, I've known her since she was like 10. She was there. All these random people. And, uh, you know, you get talking to these people. So it was almost like networking. I was getting to start to meet people in Hollywood, you know. But Howard and Austin had a dream of opening a news agency mm. and shooting the stories that the, the TV shows don't get at night because they pull the TV crews off the yeah. road at 10 o'clock because yeah. it comes becomes too dangerous yeah so we were going out after 10 o'clock we start at 10 and we finish at five o'clock in the morning we were listening to all of the, the police radios mm -hmm. so we were listening to lapd la sheriff la county fire department so we were getting all the ambulance calls as well you know so all fire and rescue so we hear everything and we were doing this in rented cars in the beginning and then um we would hear the call go out on the radio. So we had to learn all the, you know, the lingo, the code 37 for stolen cars and whatnot. And then uh, we'd hear it on the radio and then we'd go to the location. Most of the time we'd get there before the police and then we'd just start shooting it. We'd start yeah. filming from different angles. So then you film the police coming up and, you know, the fire, fire trucks coming up and they're, you know, they're getting all their gear out. We were there from the beginning. So we shoot it from beginning to end. And then we go uh, feed this out at Pacific Coast Television, which we had cameras back then with, with video tape. Yeah. So you couldn't just email it to someone or stream it, you know? Right, right. Go to this place called Pacific Coast Television in Venice, California. And this is where they, they, they feed out all the TV shows, all the movies, everything all over the world. All the, the news, everything goes live, you know, gets fed out from there. So we'd be back and forth from this place all night, shooting these stories, going back and doing that. But we did that for years and I thoroughly enjoyed it. We we then, we went from our rented cars to buying like ex-police cars, you know, the uh, police interceptors, Ford Crown Victorious. That's awesome. So we had them all blacked out, just like the cop cars. And we had the, the antennas on top, you know, so the police thought these were police cars. So when we were chasing police chases and stuff, we could kind of slip in with the police and video it. And they, they would just think we were cops. So we used to get all this fire footage, right? That's amazing. Yeah. It was all over the news, right? So I did this for like eight years straight, every night, right? And then um, one day Howard said to me that he was friends with the owner of West Coast Customs mm. and that they had done the cars for uh, um, Fast and Furious and a few other things that they did, the cars for the celebrities, the basketball players and stuff. And he said he was going to do a commercial for them. Would I like to come along and help? So I was like, fuck yeah, you know? Yeah. So so we we go over to this place the day we were getting there. I think it was a Saturday morning in Inglewood, California, right? It's the hood, right? <laughs> fuck, I love it. Huh? I'd only been in like... Uh, Marina Del Rey and Santa Monica and all. And then that's rough as well, but it's not the hood, you know? Yeah. yeah. Get to the hood and we're pulling up and there's just lines of Ferraris and Escalades with 24s on them. And it's like, you know, that car has belonged to Ludacris. That car has belonged to Juvenile. That's Kobe Bryant. That's, Sha that's Shaquille O'Neal's. Wow. You know, so it's like all these cars are there. 
And uh, I, I ended up hitting it off with the owner of West Coast Customs, Ryan. And uh, we were the very first people to film him. So we were, we were the ones that incepted Pimp My Ride, more or less, wow. right? Wow. So we, we made this promotional DVD commercial. And then from, from that, you know, we were finishing up, getting ready to leave. And I was like, I can't leave this place. And I begged Ryan, the owner, to give me a job. I said, please give me a job. He said, Trevor, I can't afford you. I said, please, just let me prove to you I can do anything. I said, I'll sweep the floor. I was like, I grabbed the broom. I was like, I'll sweep the floor. Just don't, let, just don't make me leave, right? So he was like, oh, he was like, well, okay, let's see what you're made of, right? So I just started out on the floor. Amazing. Helping the guys. I was just helping whoever. We had a stereo department. We had a paint department. We had a, a mechanical department. We had an interior department. We also rented cars out to people. We bought and sold cars. We, we had a, a big thing going in a very small location in, in Inglewood. Mm. And, uh, and then one day, one of our clients came by. He was a high-profile person who it was. But he came by and he needed some help. And everybody was gone for lunch. So our main salespeople who would have looked after them, Q or Ryan himself, weren't around. So I started to help him. And uh, we figured out whatever it was. He had some crazy Ferrari. It was amazing. I was loving it, you know. And then he left. And that was that. And um, a few hours later, Ryan gets over the intercom. And he's like, Trevor, get in my fucking office. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Because I used to take the cars out around the block and whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get caught up. And I was like, oh, I'm caught. So uh, he pulled me into the office. He usually has other people in the office. He kicks them all out of the office and he looks at me and he says, uh, so so-and-so so came by earlier today, right? And he's staring at me and I was like, yeah. And I said, I looked after him. I did the best I could. And he seemed really happy when he was leaving. And he just stayed staring at me. And I was like, what did I do? And he just stared at me. And I was getting uncomfortable and then he said, well, whatever you did, it must have been good. He really liked you. He wants you to look after his cars from now on. And he had quite a few cars. <laughs> so he said, he said, I guess go back and take your overalls off. You work in the office now. Wow. And then he said he was going to make me a business card. And I knew that our business card, West Coast Customs, would open doors for me, you know. And he was telling me that I could now be a, a sales rep, for, which is what I was really good at, you know, talking to people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so that happened and I was out dealing with, you know, influential people, rich and famous, whatever way you want to call it. The elites is yeah. who I was really dealing with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, then we, 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 uh, we landed a two part episode deal with MTV for Pimp My Ride. Mm. We did two episodes. So we put the first episode out, which wasn't any good. You know, we did better stuff after that. And it went viral overnight. Wow. And then the second episode that we put out, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know, but I believe that was the most watched show in MTV history. If it wasn't that second show, it was the third or fourth, right? But wow. we got it, right? We got the crown. So straight away, they ordered two seasons of Pimp My Ride, wow. which was going to keep us busy for like two or three years. Amazing. So straight away, West Coast Customs became famous all over the world, more or less. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I was working for Ryan. And Ryan, the owner of West Coast Customs, who accepted all this, he's a brilliant mind, right? Brilliant mind. Mm. He he likes to stay at work and get stuck into work. He, just, he goes to work at 4 a.m., Every morning. And he doesn't leave till fucking 10 o'clock at night. Wow. And he wouldn't leave the shop. He was like, he had to stay there. So he used to send me out to do stuff for him and appear at places for him and go and do deals with people or talk to people for him. So he was giving me the best job. He was giving me his job. Wow. Basically, the, the perks that he could have got, he was handing them off to me, so to speak, you know? Yeah. He's, obviously, he had his own stuff as well. But so I really got immersed in you know hollywood in you know in in basketball you know i had kobe bryant he gave me kobe bryant kobe was one of his, his star clients and the ones that he held to close to his chest and he gave me kobe and he he 
he wanted me to look after Kobe stuff. So I was regularly down at Kobe Bryant's house and wow. other, wow. other celebrities, all people that everybody know, everybody globally knows the people who I was yeah. involved yeah. with back then. Right. And uh, so I was around them, you know, a lot. And I was constantly back and forward from Ferrari dealerships and Bentley dealerships, buying cars for them. So celebrities can't show up at a car dealership because if they do, they're going to get robbed. You know, you see, they know they've got money. Yeah. But what I would do is they would call me and say, I saw this new car, that new Aston Martin. I really like it. Can you go get one, bring it to the house and we'll, we'll talk. So I'd ask them what color they want. Maybe I'd go get the car. I'd bring it to their house and we'd go through it. Right. I love this car. Uh, we can change the wheels. We can do a different interior. We can change the color of the outside. The sky's mm. the limit. So then they would give me a commitment on the car. And then I'd go back to the dealership and the dealers would only find out who's really buying the car when we we're doing the paperwork because I'd already done the deal, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I've done thousands of those, you know, throughout the years. Wow. And I do that and then, you know, go away, bring the car to West Coast Customs, leave the car with Ryan and the guys in the back and then they'd give me the car done and I'd bring it back to whoever owns it. But the ball players loved me because I'm from Ireland and I'm not into football anyway or soccer or any of that. Yeah. And I wasn't into, I'm into motorsports, you know? Yeah. So I wasn't asking them for signed balls or I wasn't right. asking them for anything. I didn't care. And they right. loved me for that, you know? Yeah. So I became really friendly with a lot of them, you know. They used to bring me to the Laker games, get me floor side to seats. Wow. They'd I would park underground with the players where the players park, nobody wow. else. Wow. I'd park underground with them and all the players, and then you know, I'd go and watch the 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 game with them and I'd leave with them. It was crazy. We used to do these motorcades where we'd all drive out together, and it was like wow. all the fans are outside waiting for you, mobbing the cars. Wow. An amazing experience amazing experience wow but then i went on from that so while i was doing all of that stuff i was also doing the news stuff at night oh you wow yeah so i was rolling into bed right or i was rolling into work at west coast customs at like 10 or 11 every morning and then i'd stay there till maybe eight o'clock at night and then i'd go home and i'd chill for about two hours have a shower, maybe a power nap. And then I'd go out with the guys doing the news stuff at 10 o'clock. We, we would do that some nights if it's quiet on the radio, you know, LA is a crazy place, especially when you listen to it on the, on the police scanners, right? You really know what's going on. And um, some nights we'd finish at two, three, four. Some nights you could end up jumping into a police chase that goes on till six in the morning, or eight wow. or whatever. So, and that was every night. That was every night, seven nights a week. I did that for years. Amazing. And then somehow in between that, I'd take nights off and I'd go off up into Hollywood. And then I knew everybody in Hollywood. So I was like VIP guest list at every nightclub, every restaurant, anywhere I wanted for the duration of my whole time in America. I used to go to Vegas. I get to Vegas. I'd always have free hotel rooms, free suites. I didn't, the only thing I'd have to pay for is dinner go out for dinner, but then I'd go to the nightclubs, free bottles of champagne, didn't have to line up, always at the best seats, you know? And it was like, because LA is so carrier orientated, you need your car and it's a status symbol. It's like a watch, right? You want to get seen in your car. Yeah. So they, they loved us because we were bringing all of this heat to them, this attention that they mm. wanted, but you know, blinging them out. Right. So I was around them all the time for years. And then I start doing car rallies, like the Gumball 3000 rally, you drive 3000 miles across the world. You're doing that with all the elites, all the royals, all the whoever from across the world, whoever's involved in it at that time. I've done like maybe five of those, which is a lot. I, I want to say seven. I think I've done seven. Wow. So I did all of that for years and years. And I was involved in the cars and the news stuff. And then... Um, one night I, uh, I was on the way back from the long, long beach grand prix and, um, yeah, I got pulled over. I was clocked at 197 miles an hour <laughs> <laughs> the Lamborghini on the four or five freeway. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I'm laughing because I just got a ticket for going 84 and a 70. I can't imagine what that, uh, that's um, pretty gnarly, man. Like you can get there so fast in these cars and then you right. can slow down as quick as you got there. So 
if you're on a straight retro, stretch of a road, yeah, it's not that dangerous. It's really not, you know. Yeah, right. but you could right. anything could happen, right? But um, yeah, I got in trouble for that, and then I, you know, I start getting into the, you know, racing cars at night, kind of with with my friends, mm. and they all had like me- mega money, so we were coming out late night race car driving in hyper cars when everybody is is asleep at like two three four in the morning wow. and we'd be in like 1300 horsepower dodge vipers ferraris lamborghinis bentley's whatever you know fast cars and then um so we did that we were doing that a lot we were the real fra- fast in the future yeah, that's I say, you became yeah we, were. yeah we were and everybody knew it as well wow and, uh, you know, I'd had warnings from people before. I mean, I was only 23, 24 when all this was happening. I was only a kid and I was immersed in this whole new world and everything was just being given to me. You know, I didn't really have to go out and do it. I just I was just being myself and, and I was following a passion that I was into. Yeah. So it was coming to me. And then uh, one day I was at Beverly Hills Bentley and uh, I was sitting there in a Hummer. It was actually belonged to Exhibit and Exhibit did. Yeah, the show. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um these guys showed up in a Rolls Royce Phantom and they got out and they were speaking to the main manager, the main guy at this place. Now, this guy supplies all the super elite, super wealthy across the planet with their cars. He is their biggest sales car salesman in the world, this one individual, right? And he'd kind of taken me under his wing like a protege. He was telling me what I needed to do and he was giving me a lot of work. So I was sitting in this Hummer waiting for him and he was with these two guys and he said, uh, he started motioning at me to come over, get out of the car and come over and talk to him. So I got out and he said, Trevor, I want to introduce you to blah, 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 blah. And he said, they were admiring the wheels on your Hummer. And uh, one of them said, yeah, we really like these wheels. They said, um, can you get us two sets of them? I was like, sure, no problem. And I said, uh, you know, we, we were doing different custom things at the time. And I said, if you don't mind me asking, I said, what color are your Hummers? I said, I did one last week and I sprayed the wheels black. It was on a black Hummer and it turned out amazing. And the ones that were on this were chrome. So and he was looking at the phone. He just looked up at me and he said, oh, we don't have the Hummers. We're going to buy the Hummers to put the wheels on. I was like, what? You know, even with everybody I'd been dealing with all along, I've never heard anything like this. Wow. And the other guy wow. said, he said, um, he said he had a Ferrari Enzo. And I was like, really? He was like, I don't have just one. I have two. I was like, no way. So we got talking about Ferrari Enzo. And how, just for context, people, I mean, how much are those cars? Million dollar car, $2 million? 1.8 million at that yeah. size. So he has two $1.8 million cars. Yeah. Right. And, a, and two McLaren SLRs who were 600 grand at the time. And he had two Rolls Royce Phantoms, which are 400 grand at the time. And then he just had random cars. Because people you don't know, know like, cars. I don't know. I wouldn't have known how much it was. So I read you, what you sent me. So like, just to give context, yeah. people listening like that's yeah that's real money yeah and that's these were the cars that we drove daily more or less wow so he said to me um he was telling me about the cars and i said believe it or not i said we have the only set of aftermarket wheels for a ferrari enzo in the world and he was like what and i was like yeah he says where are they he said can i buy them i have to buy them and I was like, they're over at West Coast Customs. He said, can we go there? I said, well, let me call my boss. Ask me, are they for sale? He said, everything's for sale. <laughs> I said, all right. So I got on the phone to Ryan and I was like, hey, there's a dude here who wants to buy the Enzo wheels. And he said, he's like, he's pushing. He really wants them. And Ryan said, well, yeah, sell them to him if he wants them. So I was like, well, I'm going to take him over. I'm going to bring him over there. Is that okay? And he says, yeah, bring him over. So I brought him over and uh, we showed him the wheels. He had a black Enzo. This thing was insane, bro. At the time, this is ro- this is a rolling art piece. That's what it really is. And it's also the safest car in the world. You know, we'll get to that, right? So he brings this. He brought me to his house up in Bel Air Crest, right? Bel Air, right across from the Getty Center in Los Angeles. Very, very uh, pivotal place in Los Angeles, right? And like, this is the most elite part of LA where you can be. 
and he's, his house is just sick. We pull up to his house and he rolls up two garages he had at both sides of his front door. And it was like, there was two Enzo's in there and there was a McLaren SLR in there. Like straight away, $5 million worth of cars, wow. you know? And then he had Harley Davidson's that were diamond encrusted. <laughs> it's so crazy, yeah. Diamond, real diamond encrusted. Yeah. Yeah, real diamonds. Wow. And then the, the Rolls Royce badge on his car, all real diamonds. Then their watches are like 400 grand a pop. Wow. Right. So I became close with him, Stefan. So I brought him over to West Coast Customs. He just was fine with leaving his ends over there, this black ends over this nearly $2 million car. And he was like, yeah, just put the wheels on, blah, blah, blah. So we had the car there. And the car was there for you know a few days while that was going on. And then he went away. And uh, I had their car delivered back to his house and he went to Europe or something. And then he came back. And when he came back, you know, I was spending time with him, you know, we got on, you know, he's a car guy. I'm a car guy. We like to drive cars and race cars, you know? So um, he took me out for dinner one night in Hollywood. We went out for dinner and we spent a few hours there. And then uh, we went back to his house in Bel Air and somewhere in the mix, he decided, let's go take the two Ferrari Enzos out and race them around, you know, LA. So this is three, four in the morning. And these cars were really loud. His neighbors fucking hated him, right? Because he used to start these cars up two o'clock in the morning, wake the whole neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. So I am, and, and the black Enzo had regular seatbelts in it, right? Mm. And the red, and that had a louder exhaust. And the red Enzo had harness seats in it and that had a quieter exhaust. And I said to him, why don't both of us just get in the red one and leave in the red one? And he was like, yeah, I think you're right. So I was like, instead of waking everybody up with the black one, right? So we get out onto the road and we, um, we head down to Santa Monica to my house and I grabbed a, a video camera, a recorder. And we stuck the video camera to the back of the thing. And we said, <laughs> right, listen, Let's just video how we roll, right? Just do what we always do, but let's let's get it on video. So, which is something I never liked doing because like, I always thought you were kind of attempting stuff to happen. You it's like leave it alone, let it be organic. If you're doing it, you're doing it. If you're not, you're not. Yeah. So we took the car out. I was driving actually, and I drove down as far as PCH in Malibu. We pulled into a, a, a filling station, we filled up with gas. And then I got back in and I drove out and then we pulled up further up the road. I was showing him a house that was for sale and we stopped there. We had a quick look at it and then uh, he started driving. So we got out of there. He'd never driven on these roads before. Mm. Right. So his first time driving down PCH in Malibu and we get out onto the road and he's just getting on it. And I'm, I'm loving it. I was like, go, go, go. <laughs> so I'm showing him. He's, he's on my left. I'm in the passenger seat on the right. And I'm showing him the road. But we couldn't hear each other because the car is like an F1 car. Like it's that loud. And we're dealing like crazy speeds, right? So the engine's high revs. So I'm telling him, go, go, go. Slow down, slow down. Stop, you know, like all these hand signals. Yeah. And uh, we get to this straight. We're coming up over a hill and it comes down into a kind of a, a verge and then straight. And we came up over this hill and as we were coming down, we hit a bump in the road. It was like an invisible river that was going under. It was like you'd barely feel it, but at that speed, we hit it. And the back of the car just bottomed out, hit the road, and the car just went sideways and we lost control. But we were doing over 200 miles per hour when this happened. Yeah. So... I got a fright. <laughs> yeah. I immediately had an outer body experience. Wow. I met with God. Mm. Everything stopped. This is at about 4.55 a.m. Mm. And everything stopped. It was dark when we lost control in the car. And by the time, you know, we then we lost control and there was all these impacts. And I just kept saying to myself, the next one is the last one. Mm. And I kept picturing my mom and just telling her, I love her. And I'm so sorry that this is how I went. Mm. And I'm sorry I didn't listen to you because I'd been warned about this. You know, I'd been playing with cars, fast cars all my life. 
You know? Bro, can I tie something in real quick? How ironic that you told that nun, if I got hit by a car, would you put that photo of me on the wall? And here you are in the car. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. Fascinating. So, yeah. So, so we had all these impacts, crazy impacts. You saw the car at the end, right? It's a yeah. Ferrari, $1.8 million Ferrari Enzo cut in half. Yeah. And we hit a pole when the car was spinning and the pole hit right behind my head, like right behind it. And then the car, you know, skidded to a stop, but it landed back on the road. We went off the fucking road up into a field, hit a pole and somehow ended up back on the road and the water was on the other side. So we could have went into the ocean at that speed. Right. So car skids to a stop and it was bright. So we, we crashed right at dawn. It was dark in the video, even when we lost control. But then by the time the car skidded to a stop and, you know, everything stopped, it was bright. So I looked across at Stefan and he was kind of passed out. So Stefan is six foot eight, I think. Oh, big, big man. Yeah. Huge. And he's built like this. Yeah. He's a he's Swedish wow. bodybuilder. Wow. And I pulled him out of the car. So uh, I jumped out of the car. When I got out, the road was on fire because the, pet, the the gas tank had exploded. So the road was on fire. It was just gas. So that was all happening. <laughs> and the car was in pieces everywhere. And I went back around to his door to open his door to try and get him out because he was passed out. But he, th his door wouldn't open. So then all of this shit's going on. And I went around and I remember taking his harness off him. So he... I could get him out and he was kind of half coming to, but he was out of it, gone. And then all of a sudden we were outside the car. I don't even remember pulling him out, but I did. And he, he tells people as well, we both say the same thing. How did he get out of the car? But I took him out and we sat at the side of the road and then um, we were just sitting there and he was kind of coming to, and I was just like, what the fuck just happened? And I was like, wow. And then, he stood up and then uh, the two of us just hugged each other and we were laughing. We were just like, holy shit. Like we didn't care about the car. We didn't care about anything. You'd only realize when you're in a situation like that, that the car didn't matter. Yeah. Nothing mattered. We were alive. We absolutely just tempted death on this horse that does over 200 miles an hour, you know, the Ferrari horse. And uh, so we're standing there and then all of a sudden, I could hear a helicopter mm. and then a helicopter came and it was like, Oh shit. And I'm in the news stuff. I knew all of that stuff. Right. We only shot the stuff and gave it out to them, but yeah. you kind of knew behind what goes on. So the helicopter arrives and then another helicopter arrives and then another helicopter arrived. There was 12 helicopters in wow. the air, 12, not one, not two, 12. And then there was the search and rescue, which was part of it as well. And the police, the police had two helicopters there. And then there was, did all this shit was going on. It was just crazy. And then the police showed up and right as the police were showing up, my client, I was in the car with Stefan said to me, we can't say I was driving. Mm. And I was like, well, I wasn't driving. And he said, yeah, but we can't say I was driving. And I was like, well, who was driving? <laughs> you see their car in the middle of Malibu, right? Out in the middle of nowhere. We were deep down Malibu, right? Point Doom, I think we were down there. Or Zuma Beach. And, um, and it's like six in the morning. Mm. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's just, just, just gotten bright. And uh, so then all of a sudden, then he was like, let's say we met somebody. Uh, we met somebody at the restaurant we were out at the night before earlier. And he was interested in, buying the car so Stefan said he'd let him test drive it and then we were out and they were in the car and I was in another car behind and then but I was with that guy's friend Stefan's my friend he was with him and then he he skidded out and lost control and crashed and the two of them got out and they were okay and I got out and we were all talking and then that guy who was driving Dietrich, 
we said his name was, we made it up, obviously, right? Yeah. But we said his name was Dietrich. I looked across at Stefan while the cop was talking to me. Stefan had said all this stuff and we didn't have a name or anything. We hadn't finished our story. And, and Stefan says, uh, our, the cop said to me, what was his name? And I, I just went, I knew exactly what I was doing. I said, hey, Stefan, what was that guy's name? You know, I stepped away from the cop and the cop was like, no, 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 you come back here. I said, what was his name? What was his name? And he said, uh, Dietrich. And I looked at him and when he said Dietrich and I just said, of all the fucking names you could say, Dietrich, that's one of the rarest names I've ever heard in LA. <laughs> Why did he say Mike? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, so this guy started, the, the cop starts asking me and I'm just going along with it. I was like, yeah, this guy was driving, blah, blah, blah. So we said that this guy, Dietrich, got out of the car and ran off up the hill. And then his friend who was in the car behind us that I was passenger with, panicked and drove off and now all of a sudden it's just me and stefan there it was like it was a crazy story we should have just told the truth right yeah so we told this story the cops were getting really pushy then i don't think they fully you know believed everything and it was a fairly outlandish story but there was a ferrari enzo and pieces on the ground and we were like i had, I had fifty thousand dollar rolex on me he had a four hundred thousand dollar rolex on him so it was like they believed us so then we said that we were going to leave and the cops weren't too happy about us leaving, but there was nothing had to happen. Like we didn't kill anybody, and, yeah. you know, so we started. Yeah. 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 So we left there and, um, we had two of his security guys pick us up and, um, we left and then we got back to LA and he had a bunch of lawyers waiting for us when we got to his house in, in Bel Air and we got there and there was just blacked out cars everywhere. Wow. And um, we walked in and we were, we were told that those guys over there are your lawyer, Stefan, and these guys over there are your lawyers, Trevor. So we both had teams of lawyers waiting for us. This is four hours after the crash, right? So I go over to my guys and they, um, they start talking to me and say, how are you? Do you need anything from us? Don't worry. You're going to be fine. We're going to make this go away. And, um, you know, this was a room full of very, very serious people. Everybody in this room was a serious person by themselves. Yeah. And then you yeah. had them all in one place, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, we then said that we were going to meet up later in the week and they were going to talk to me, but don't worry, you know, anything happens, call them. So, you know, a day after, the day of this shit was all over the news. This crash was all over the news, all mm -hmm. over, you know, top of the hour, every hour. And then, um, then other stories started coming out. They said that I lived on a $14 million yacht in Marina del Rey and that they had tried to come and speak to me and that I wasn't there, but that wasn't my yacht. That was his yacht. Mm. Right. So there was nothing to do with me, but I did live in Marina del Rey. I actually lived right across the street from it, but I never said I had anything to do with that. So they were putting in weird shit. Mm. Then they start bringing up stuff about his past, you know, life in Europe. And it was colorful. But all of these elites and these big people in these big companies have colorful pasts, yeah. you know? So it was like I was getting caught up in that. And I didn't want any of that because I had nothing to do with it. This was just another client of mine. Yeah. So I started talking to people at home as well. And I was like, you know, I didn't tell many people at home what was going on. And the internet wasn't that big at that time. I, I, and at the at the time the internet was taken off and this ended up being the most google thing in history up until that point wow. it was the most searched thing on the google platform <laughs> up until that time right it was everywhere even now like when you google my name there's all kinds of stories all kinds of weird shit that people just made up or whatever or assume and i haven't read 90 percent of them because it's all just bullshit anyway yeah. and then you've got all these new news agencies all across the world right these news agencies right. broadcasting agencies witchcraft doctors right yeah, yeah. using yeah. my name and fucking spreading this story across the planet that's not accurate mm. and the real story is way more entertaining, not entertaining. It's more real yeah. and sobering and uh, eye-opening than any bullshit that they ever would have put out. Right. All this stuff was going on. And then uh, I decided to go home. 
Mm. And I went back to Ireland. I hid out there for a year to stay away from it. And, you know, I had all kinds of people reaching out to me, trying to get me to do interviews and I wouldn't do it. And then, um, and then those lawyers had told me that if I went back, if I left it for a year and then went back, that it would all be forgotten about that let him go through whatever he's going to go through because of the crash and that his shit would be over and that you'd be clear to come back. Mm -hmm. So almost a year to the day I went back to Los Angeles, it was St. Patrick's day, 2008, no, 2007. And I arrived there on St. Patrick's day and I just started to pick my life back up from where I left off. I reconnected with my network, but some of the elites, didn't want to want, they just said to me, look, you've, you, you've had a lot of media attention attached to you. And we just don't want that heat brought to the family or whatever, you know, these are different elite families. And I fully understood it, you know, fully understood it. I was like, I get it, you know, but we still talked, you know, it was just like, we had to, we couldn't interact with each other as much as we used to in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So I was fine with that. And I just got on with my life. And then, um, yeah, then, so I was back doing the car stuff and everything. And then one morning I woke up to the door coming through and it was a Homeland Security SWAT team with LA County Sheriff's Department and LAPD. And I want to say the FBI was there as well. Wow. And they had a helicopter outside flying around. They all came in in ski masks with lasers on fucking MP4s or whatever they were. Wow. And I, I was like shocked to say the least and they got me up and they put a bag over my head so i couldn't see their faces they handcuffed me and then they pulled the thing off my head and then i could see their faces and then i was like well why did you do that if you were just going to show me your face anyway? yeah yeah stupid and i just sat there and i said to them i was like i just this is exactly what i said to them i just said wow wow i am flattered I said, all you had to do was call me mm. and you just did all of this mm. and all you had to do was call me. Mm. And they, um, they didn't question me very much. They said, uh, you were involved in this incident, this Ferrari crash, and you didn't make yourself available for questioning. So you're being charged with obstruction of justice, resisting arrest and giving false information mm. and driving under the influence. Right. And I wasn't driving. So they were dealing me with driving under the influence. So they arrested me. Uh, Homeland Security took possession of me. So they say, you have to take possession of a soul, right? right. They, um, they kidnapped me and uh, they, <laughs> they handed me over to the sheriff's department. And the sheriffs took me to Twin, to, uh, Twin Towers Correctional Facility in downtown Los Angeles. Wow. And that is the most dangerous jail in the free world. Mm. They put me through this torturous induction thing that you go through, how they check you into jail. And then they deem me to be um, a risk. So they made me a, uh, because of my connections, the guy I was in a Ferrari crash with has connections to the mafia. And, you know, I have an ability to get resources together if I wanted to get myself out or somewhere, right? Just get a helicopter to land in the in the courtyard and I'll say goodbye. And I'll go to Ireland again for a yeah, year yeah. and then come back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, they uh, they they made me a maximum security prisoner, a K10 high power uh, prisoner. Wow. So I was in on this death row style place in a, a cell on my own. Every time they took me out of the the cell. They put me in handcuffs and chained my handcuffs to my waist and my ankles were, were chained to each other and then a chain up between my hands and my ankles. It was crazy, right? But what was I there for? A full set of misdemeanors, not one felony. Mm. They were all misdemeanors. Mm. And I was mixed in with like serial killers, you know, and, and gang leaders, the leaders of the gangs that are killing people in mass on the streets. Right. So I was going to court on all these bullshit charges and they were throwing all this traffic shit at me just to clock up time, you know, because they did nothing else on me really. So 
I kept putting in um, petitions to the judge to be taken from maximum security and put into general population, where which was technically more dangerous. Right. Because I was then, wants, yeah, before they get sorted out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. And so I was put in with murderers. You know, everybody yeah. was murdered. I was by this time I was used to talking to these people, you know, and they were all okay. You know, they just, you know, some of them were some of these people, you look at them and you say, you're exactly where you need to be and you should never be released. And then other people's stories that you're hearing where these people were just fucked over by the system, like sad stories, man, really sad stories. And now all of a sudden they're in the system and they can't get out of it and they've nobody to help them. Right. So I I was put in with those guys. I hit it off with everybody. Everybody loved me because they'd all seen me on TV with a Ferrari crash. Even the cops, you know, if I was walking past, even though they were constantly assholes, they were never nice to me, right? But they would be sarcastic and condescending or whatever, but they'd be pointed out to other cops. That's that dude, you know? Wow. And um, But all the, you know, the outsiders, you know, the Mexican gangsters with the tattoos on their faces, we had the paisas, wow. we had the bloods and the crips, were, which were part of the, the, the blacks, and then you had the whites. And, you know, I got on with everybody. They all love me and I loved all of them. And I used to love hearing their stories. And they used to be asking me, tell me more. And I was like, no, you tell me your story. (laughs) So I was in there. So I got to see the the prison system, jail system from the very top, maximum security. So I got in there, got to spend three months there, see all that, how that works. Being loaded onto these buses like you're on Con Air, you know, heading to court every day. And, you know, I actually had an incident with my back. I'd had a prison previous injury with my back and I hurt it in jail and ended up having to go to hospital Mm. because I was a maximum security prisoner. They had the ambulance come. Then they had a police car in front and a police car behind with four cops in each car with shotguns and AK 47 or not AKs, AR 15s or whatever. That guy was going to fucking break out with a fractured back. Right. So they were doing all this shit. And I, I, my back was like that for, for a couple of months and they were bringing me to court on a fucking stretcher. Wow. That's how petty these people are. And I was there for misdemeanors, Mm. not a murder trial. This, this wasn't Ghislaine Maxwell. Right. Right. They were bringing me on a gurney, to court every day and the ambulance people were saying to me this is crazy and i was like i know i'm in pain blah, blah, blah. anyway i finally got out of there and then put in you know put back into general population and then uh, they took me from there when i did my time and they put me back into homeland security custody mm. so i'd been prepared to be deported this whole time that i was in jail it was like 11 months there and then all of a sudden they said they were releasing me back out into the general, like onto the street. They were releasing me and that I wasn't being um, deported. After everything they just put me through, mm. they, they released me back out onto the street. I got back out, rebuilt my life again after, you know, third time after the Ferrari crash. And that's when this in- incident with the Lamborghini happened where a helicopter was passing over and we were, we just left the Long Beach Grand Prix. I was racing a Ferrari and we got onto the motorway and a Hawthorne PD helicopter was flying overhead, which has nothing to do with the roads, but he clocked how fast I was, I was going. So he locked onto me and followed me and radioed ahead and the police came out. And wow. when, when I was getting off, off the freeway to head back into Beverly Hills, there was police everywhere waiting for me and they pulled me in took me arrested me they knew who i was and they deported me from america wow a barack obama himself signed my deportation papers wow they 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 couldn't wait to get me out of america and this is while i was like kind of fighting to stay there after they released me i had court dates and stuff to you know plead my case and try and stay there but as far as i'm concerned i'm a man on the land you know, I didn't come to Earth to fill out paperwork yeah. and do courses to fit into their little scheme that they have going. I don't believe in any of that. Yeah. You know, God sent me to Earth. He didn't say, oh, you can't go to these places. And if you do, they're going to ask you for a visa or any of this shit. I don't give a fuck about any of that stuff. Right. You know. Before, um, 
there's more of the story, but I want to get into the ayahuasca. Like when you have this out of, you have this out of body, you're, you're raised in the antichrist system of the Catholic Roman, the Roman, Holy Roman Catholic church. Okay. So you're in that Jesus loves you. Therefore we beat the shit out of you. And if you don't know that we love you and he loves you, we'll beat you some more. Um, You know, exactly. So you're, you're raised in that. Your soul is an honest soul. So you were, they knew it. They allowed you in and then probably testing you if you would ever break and turn on any of them. That's what probably the system was, what kept you in there. And every day, like provoking, like what's he, you know, what's this breaking point? They realize, no, it's, he is who we know he is. They release you. And, yeah. but you have that out of body experience. And then you go into, I want to hear about the ayahuasca because I think, and I've shared many, many, episodes about i don't know i think i've shared a lot or mainly all my journeys and different things i mean psychedelics has been a huge um massively healing component of my life and i i'm a huge proponent of it done in right setting and set intention and all that and integration and all the beauty that comes with it um but i want to hear about that brother like let's so so i'm We'll skip the story, right? There's, there's a lot of between the end of me in America and then I carried on what I was doing after that, right? Same kind of lifestyle. In, in I was getting to the end of the road. I'd done everything. I wasn't as into it anymore. And it wasn't showing me anything new. You know, the, the, the adventure was gone. Yeah. But I was growing up as well. Like I was late 30s at that stage. I'd had a serious drink problem. Well, I say I have a serious drink problem. Other people wouldn't say that, but it was just, I was doing too much partying, you know, and I decided I didn't want to drink anymore. I didn't want to party anymore. And I wanted to kind of, you know, give that up and try and get some kind of a normal life together. Right. Because I hadn't had a normal life at all, ever. Right. right. So um, a friend of mine, I got talking to a friend of mine and we said we were going to sign up for this ayahuasca retreat. Mm. So before it, they said that I needed to go on a, a, a diet. Detox. It was, yeah. yeah. A diet, diet. right? Yeah. yeah. And so no salt, no sugars, no oil, no processed food, and no meat. So like that was hard for me. You know, it was like that was really hard. But in the lead up to it and, and doing the diet, I noticed that I felt a million dollars in the lead up to it. I was starting to actually feel good. I was starting to feel like me again before Hollywood got a hold of me and molded me into something else, you know? Yeah. Um, a man of the world, you could say, right? That's what I became. And that's not what I was. I was from Earth and I was a spiritual being, right? Yeah. And I was always super spiritual throughout all of it. That's what kept me safe. Mm. So, um, Yeah, I go to the retreat, but actually I'll tell you a funny story. On the way to the retreat, I went to a car show and I was in a, I was in a fast car and there were some kids outside with video cameras and they said, do a burnout, do a donut. And I was like, all right, fuck it. Yeah. So I started doing donuts. And then, uh, so I went into the show then. And when I came back out, the kids were waiting for me. Oh, please do another one. And I was like, I'll, I'll go one better. And I said, Go up there, and when I come out onto this road, I'll, I'll proper drift sideways out onto the road, right? Watch the traffic. Stop the traffic for me. So I come out of this road, and I come out, like, sideways, right? Proper sideways. And uh, the kids are all getting it. They're all loving it. And then all you hear is, whoop. Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah, the police. So I had two options. I was on my way to an ayahuasca retreat. Wow. I could stop and talk to these guys and most likely get arrested or I could just pretend they're not there and kind of just go on my way. And so that's what I decided to do. So I just took off. So they took off, they took off after me. So, and then I could see two or three different cars in the, in the mirror. And I was like, Oh no, here we go. I'm going to get arrested. But this night, of ayahuasca that I was going to was going to be the biggest night of my life. I couldn't let that happen. So I got on the motorway and I just boned out, said goodbye to them. And that was the end of it. So I got to the, yeah, 
I got to the end. I, I actually drove up into the mountains, right? Wow. And I was up in the mountains wow. and I was looking down at the police cars from the lights on the motorway and the helicopter going around looking for me. But this has been my whole life, right? That's kind of how I, you know, how I used to have a fun time, right? I used to yeah. take you. So anyway, so I arrived at this ayahuasca retreat mm. after just doing that. My, my energy was through the roof, like my <laughs> adrenaline and everything. Yeah. So I am. Um, I had to kind of land the plane and calm down and go into the retreat and settle down. One of my friends was there and he had found out what had happened. He was like, you're here. And I was like, I barely made it. Yeah, but I'm here. And then, uh, yeah, that night we did ayahuasca for the first night. Mm. And oh my God. Mm. Well, oh my God. I met God. Yeah. Yeah. I actually met God. Yeah. Now, ayahuasca for anybody who doesn't fully understand what it is, is or what it does is, Ayahuasca is a brew from the Amazon jungle that is prepared by shamans. It's um, what is it? It's it's a chacruna and the yeah the, the, the leaf the root. Of, yeah the root of the the ayahuasca plant is the inhibitor, right? I forget which one's what. Yeah, the DMT one of, is in that. Yeah, okay. And yeah. then there's an inhibitor that that yeah. helps that come into your yeah. They mix them together and they pray over it, and then you drink it, and then then it basically cleanses your, your gut, which is your first brain, right? Mm -hmm. And then when that happens, you flicker on to Christ consciousness, mm -hmm. which is your connection to God. Mm -hmm. And then when that happens, your vision expands, and then you start to have dreams and visions from the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these dreams and visions are all very important times throughout your life where things happened that changed you they are traumas that have been concealed inside you mm. throughout your whole life that you didn't know that you've been carrying the whole time right you've been carrying them along the way so i got i started seeing these you know visions from the past mm. and things from childhood random stuff you know random nothing to do with any of these major things that happened in my life none of them at all but i start seeing other things and then that started to present to me the trauma that I'd been carrying all along mm. and show me a way to let it go and move past it and move into a new way of being. And that's what I did. I did ayahuasca. I've done ayahuasca over 30 times now. I've gone far with it, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. bordering shamanism at this stage, you know, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. learned so much about that road yeah. and I've, I've helped set up ayahuasca retreats in spain ireland iceland wow. i've even given some pe people help in america to try and get it going because this is what's really wrong with us all along we are lap we are in this box yeah. of trauma yeah a That's cube right. a black cube of trauma you could call it right you could fold that cube out what does that make a cross yeah right and when they say about if, if any of these people who, you know, we say they, right, these elites, these, you know, um, people that are hiding our, our true religion and spirituality from us, they say that we're people that think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? That's right. And they always saw me as somebody who thinks outside the box. So I wasn't getting caught up in religion ever. Although I fully believe in Jesus. Jesus is real, right? Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. 100%. He came. He, he destroyed their, their way of life for them back then yes. and put everybody else yes. on Christ consciousness. And, and we, we gained peace after that. And we learned a lot. And, you know, nobody had to experience death after that because he did that. That's right. But then, um, you know, they somehow br brought us back into it. But he's coming back to fuck that up as well. And we all believe that. And that will come to pass. Yes. Um, yeah. By the we, way, if he's not here already waiting like he might be here already he's here yeah yeah like fit in physical form just he's at the physical. right time to take that all that yeah 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 he is, yeah, he is. all right we know that all right yeah, yeah. they know that but yeah. they'll have you believe that he's gonna come on a horse through the clouds in the sky and that don't believe anything else until you see that happen yeah and have you ever seen anything like that happen before no no 
Neither am I. He's real. He's alive and he's here. But so is every other MVP in history. Robin Hood is here. Joan of Arc is here. Mm. You know, these are souls from the past who really, you know, helped to shape history around that time and, and, you know, beat off tyranny. And now they've all come back. And together, who are they? They're the Avengers. Mm. And they're all incarnated in here together right now. They're the star seeds. They're the saints. They're walking gods. That's what they are. We all are, right? But they'll never let us say that. Because when you realize you're an, a, an infinite being having an infinite, uh, you know, uh, a short experience, what are you? You're a god, right? You're an, uh, yeah. So yeah. they've been blocking all of this stuff for us and filling us full of shit through their religions, all their religions and all yeah. their doctrines and their schools, which are training facilities for children to go into corporations, right? Yeah. So how the fuck were we supposed to believe any of this to begin with? Shame on us for believing any of that, right? You know what they say, well, seminary se- semen inseminating in seminary to create a new offspring of a cemetery mindset a death mindset seminary is a cemetery it's where your god consciousness goes to die and you submit to the machinery and it's so interesting become an order follower exactly right and you know it's so interesting brother like the one infinite creator, God, the most high God, which is love and light. And the Bible says God is light and in him. There is no darkness at all. Of course, because if you open any closet door, that door behind you, does darkness spill out or does light go in? Of course, light goes in. So darkness only exists in the absence of light. Yeah. And the same God who is light and love and consciousness and, and beauty and not trauma created this planet with all these plants and herbs. And what is Genesis 1-1 about? The herb in itself, the seed in itself. They ate the herbs of the earth. Why? What was this consciousness that they were consuming? They're consuming ayahuasca. And by the way, anyone that does research, the MAH, whatever the inhibitor, MAO MAO inhibitor doesn't even grow where the ayahuasca vine grows. They're they're not miles and miles apart. But these people, God showed them to bring these two together. God showed them. Yeah. And you know, the Catholic church, when they come with that nasty incense down the aisle, well, yeah. back in, back in the day, and they even, an archeologist, they found this, um, they found this rabbi satchel, a dead rabbi in um, Israel buried in a tomb. And in his satchel had all the 11 spices of the temple. Well, one of it was cannabis. So when they actually were doing the incense, it was cannabis. It was a whole bunch of, when Moses marries Jethro's daughter. Now Jethro was the high priest of the Midianites who are now the Druze who now people say that Jesus is uh, the Armenian bloodline is through the Druze bloodline. It's super interesting stuff, but the, 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 the Midianites were the number one shamans of the middle East at at that region with the, with the acacia tree, which is the, the greatest DMT, uh, containing plant in the Middle East. So of course, when Moses sees the burning bush and it's not on fire, but God talks to him out of the burning bush. See, the machine says this is literal because machine, the AI system, the matrix, the satanic black cubed non-organic life cannot understand nuance. No. So how do we know when a a cake or cookies like you could follow the directions but how do you know it's just the perfect like yeah. a perfect cookie ai zeros and ones binary code can never tell humans yeah. that it's good yes it is a cookie yes it is but it's not great because it's not human there's no nuance in that that production so yeah. all these plants and herbs and ayahuasca and all these beautiful, the mushrooms and, and everything that is here to teach us when the machine gets it, it makes it literal because it can't understand conceptual ideology. Well, they have to explain it in a way that they can dumb it down. So, you know, it exists, but you can't figure out exactly how it works exactly. and you can never find your way to it. That's right. It's always somewhere else. I would- it's always like you walk in, you know, four different directions, but you'll always be inside the box. That's you right. Never quite see anything. Yeah. For what it really is. I was talking to a friend yesterday, uh, Gordana Burnett, who's one of Oprah's 100 super soul teachers. And she's 
breaking she i mean her and her husband they've broken out of the system and they they're awesome people they you know we could all have this conversation and she was saying well my husband um talking about, well, what's this narrative of follow Jesus? And I said, and she's like, well, it's within. And I said, yeah, Jesus said, I am my father one. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. But when he says, follow me, he's not saying go to where I go. He's yeah. saying do as I I'm doing. do. Yeah. Oh, but get this. I said to her yesterday, I go like teaching someone how to drive a car is like, right. You get in, you do this. Exactly. Like, you know what you want to do. Yeah. You do it. But then yeah. Rome, Rome says this, that Holy Roman Catholic church, the big machine with its gnarly teeth says, yeah, follow Jesus. Yeah. And everyone's like, follow Jesus. Well, how, how perfect for the system that killed Jesus Exactly. Just follow them. Follow them. We'll we'll take you every time and kill you every single time. And Jesus said, "Do not go into that system. Do yeah. not." Be, you know, like it's so crazy. Two Pharisees. Pharisees. It's the same people today. Yes. The ones who are telling us that we need to get the job. It's the exact same entities. That's it. The same people that were involved in all of that back then. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So I just had to share all that stuff. I just love that. Uh, so keep going, brother. I don't mean right. hijack. I just think it's just beautiful, man. What did you from those from those journeys, from those traumas, from the healing, from the actually being able to process it without being in it and seeing it? Like what opened for you, or what? Like what happened to you through this? And I don't mean like, what was the journeys like? You know what I mean? Like what? What happened? How did it change me? Alignment happened. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. Well, well, I gave up drinking overnight. I was able to give up drinking overnight and I haven't drank since. Wow. Uh, it opened up my perception, how I see the world. Mm. It made my perception broader, which meant I could calculate more things at once which mm. meant I could look around at things and tie them all into, into each other and make sense of them. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you brought everything. Everything wasn't so scattered anymore. I could see how everything works, mm. you know, and how everything works together. And it's like after, especially the system, like it turned me into a freedom fighter straight away, right? Because I realized that this system that I'd run up against, you know, all the way through my life, which is, you know, the court system and police and schooling and corporations, and even down to elites that I was dealing with, who I, I went head to head with them. You know, I, I, I was never afraid of anyone. I tell these people to go fuck themselves constantly. Right. And they never went for me. They knew that I was a star seed light bearer here to change the fucking place, not yeah. to go along with it. Yeah. So they always stayed away. I was hot, you know, mm. and they would try and guide me off course a lot. You know, mm. they tried to guide me away from, you know, I've seen a lot of crazy shit yeah. and I've been involved in a lot of crazy shit yeah. in the background. Yeah, as you know, and I think maybe we should do a two part on this, and we can yeah. we can hit it next time. I think we can go deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and now we've laid it out for people, you know, on the lead yeah. up to the next one, and the next one is way more important in global affairs yeah. and the reality in which we live yeah. than the first one ever was. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it made me see and tie in people who I was connected to and how they're connected to. The doom that we've been living through that's the truth i hate to say it but you know some of these elites were really nice to me they were good to me they were always you know warm and friendly with me um but some of the other ones you know i saw them for what they were and i wasn't afraid to go up against them the kardashians are one of them i'll throw that out there right away you know you get all these people that get a bit of pr and then off the back of pr they've built careers and off the back of the careers they've gotten sponsorship deals off the back of the sponsorship deals, they're being saturated more out to the, the general population, right? And then those deals go global because they're corporations, so they're in every country. And these people are full of fucking shit. Yeah. Yeah. They're full of shit. All of them are full of shit. And it's like even the elites, the ones with all of this, you know, mega money, they're not as scary as everybody is making them out to be. They're yeah. still people at the end of the day. Yeah. And we need the people that are around them to realize what they are doing and they're forced hand in a position to make them stop. That's right. That's right. Like I'm reaching out to their security 
and the people who enable them. You know, you could step up now and stop these people from what they're doing. You have that power right now and the world will make you a king for it. The yep. world will sing your praise for it. We need you right now to step up and stop these guys. I've been fighting these elites for 20 years. Mm. You know, I have the ones, you know, people I'm friends with and then people that I, I'm, I'm around because I'm friends with them. But now they're really bad. And I'd always go up against them, especially with a few drinks in me. I'm Irish. I was constantly trying to get in fights with them. <laughs> Yeah, 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 not a problem, not a problem. Yeah, in 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 five star resorts, and I ain't going around trying to start fights with them. But it is what it is. Yeah. I saw them for what they were. Mm. I've been intuitive since I was a kid. Intuitive yeah. psychic that is. So I figure stuff out when it's around me. That's that's part of how I've been so successful. Mm. And anything I want, I get because I can feel my way there. You know, mm. and um, you know, I always kind of wanted to find these people. Since I was in school, since I was beaten around by these nuns, I wanted to get to, well, who runs the world? Yeah. Who's their boss? How does it Making work? Them do it. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Brother. So, so, so I found myself to the top of the food chain of the corporate world, of Hollywood, and also the Catholic Church. Because mm. a lot of the people I was dealing with are Jesuits, yep. they're Freemasons, they're right. Illuminati, That's right. they're Rosicrucians. Right. Like, true, like, all my friends are pretty much Illuminati. Mm. The people who I was hanging out with, I'm, I'm, I'm probably one of the only people who wasn't. But they knew that I wasn't on their frequency and wouldn't, wouldn't acclimate to that and that I couldn't be a part of it. So they, they used my light, they used my energy to propel them and do whatever they wanted me to do for them. And then like kind of tried to walk me into positions where I got myself in trouble, which did happen, right? Even the Ferrari crash. Yeah. You know, these things have happened and these people are, they, they are on another level. We're on Christ consciousness, Christ frequency, Christ consciousness. They're on a whole nother consciousness. Mm -hmm. They don't see what we see. They don't feel what we see, feel what we feel. They don't want what we want. They just want more. They want to consume. Yeah. You know, you, there's layers to this. They're, they're harboring the Anunnaki consciousness and the Draco consciousness. They look like us. Yeah. They sound like us, but they don't act, think, or feel like us. That's right. And this is why this is so important. Where you just said they want to consume. It's consume, consume, consume. And consume. you can never give that enough. I, I, I This next episode that we do, I want to share more of my story with you and, and your story. So we can that. really get into like this. Yeah. Um, Let's go deep. They about satanic pedophilia and yes. how expansive yes. this is, yes. is, where it is. Yes. Who's involved? What yes. they own? Yes. You know what I mean? What they control? Yes. Because you will find that all of these control structures out there, anybody who's in a position to control has been put there by one of these satanic that's, that's exactly right. murderers. Yep. Yes. That's right. So anybody who has that major money is 1 billion percent a part of it. Yes. You can go out and have businesses. There's people who've worked hard and they have their businesses and they've done it. Honestly, but they're few and far between. Mainly, yeah. all of these businesses are satanic. That's right. Yes. Bro, and here's one of the things that's interesting. That system will take everything from you and give you nothing. That narcissistic, that's what people like. I'm, I, I was raised by, I was raised by someone who would take everything and give me nothing. You told me. I, I, you know, he did. Yeah. We talked, and, and, and I did everything to try to please and honor. And, and at the same time, I never could. And so I tried to figure it out. And I'm the only non cap My brother and I are the only non-Catholic in 32 first cousins in this huge Irish Catholic power structure in the state of Washington, blah, 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 blah. And here, the Irish connection, just while you're at it, sorry, very important, very quickly. The Irish connection is key. Yeah, bro. Mm. Yeah, I know. I'm so excited. I'm so we, we talk about Israel all the time and about how Israel is the promised land, land and the holy land and all this bullshit. That's a lie. Yeah. Well, oh, it comes oh. back to Ireland and Freemasonry starts in Scotland mm. with, with you know 33rd yeah. degree yeah. Freemasonry and all. But where did they get their powers from? They got their powers from Ireland. They stole their powers from Ireland. Mm. So all of this. It's not witchcraft. It's something way more than that. It's part of our tools yeah. that we were supposed to use. It's all from Ireland. The Dude. Druids 
ran planet Earth. They were the judge, jury, and executioner. They were the most heaviest beings that have ever come to planet Earth. They were so respected. And the Germans, the Romans, the Swedish, uh, the Brits, and the Icelandics, and a few others came in here to get our Druids. And when they killed the Druids, the spiritual light of the Gosh. world. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. Over the Jesus story. Let's go back. You know, this this is over that. This supersedes that because that all links with, with Jesus as well. Yeah. What he was trying to conserve, these people were keeping it alive from. And then the cabal came in, which yeah. was all these armies and took them out. Yeah. And, and it actually made the world less safe because yes. the Druids were gone. Yes. Oh, bro. That's where we, we're going to get. I want to go into all that and more. Um, yeah. I We've covered just, a lot today already, but I will just say this. I want to end on, you said that they'll take, they just want to consume, yeah. which is why when people don't understand the darkness, and this is why we have to teach the darkness to put in context, the light, because when Jesus says, when someone asks you to go a mile and you go two miles, when someone says, can I have your coat and you give them your, like when you, not because you have to willingly give versus have to give that. They will stuff, take. They'll take it, but you, we break the spell in our sovereignty. When we reclaim, I don't have to give you anything, but I choose to give those who aren't taking from me that which you've taken everything. See, yeah. it's all about breaking the spell, breaking the, breaking the lies. That's what I was talking about. Like, we have the it's, it's breaking. Well, what we're doing and the world that you and I and the others like us yeah. are bringing to earth, right, is service to others. Over That's right. Service to self. That's it. That's it. Our STS, service to self. Mm. We're service to others. That's right. Which means that I get light in my heart when I do something nice for someone else and I see how happy they are. Yes. And I'm just like, that's what five minutes of my day means nothing to me, but it meant the world to them. them. Now check this out. The word love in Hebrew in the, in the old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, there's only one word for the word love. And it's the word Ahava. Ahava mm -hmm. means to give. Right. So love, real love, infinite, unconditional God consciousness, love yeah. always gives to us. It yeah. never takes from us yeah. and that the world that they teach is take everything, but God consciousness love a Hava is to give. Yes. So and they want you to like exchange this paper money in yeah. order to give somebody something. In other words, you deserve something back if you give anybody anything. And that's the only way it should be. But even at that, they don't want to give you nothing back. That's why all of these, um, these um, cancer, um, what am I looking for? Cancer uh, charities. 90% mm. of them are scams. Yeah. Susan G. Komen, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, it's just Look at Joel Olstein. Like oh, he's man. packing the walls with cash. Yeah. That yeah. dude hates humans. He's not human. Yeah. He's, he's, he's something else. He's not human. Yeah. yeah. Brother, I can't wait. Uh, next episode, we're going to go deep. And I just want you to know, uh, uh, thank you. Thanks for, I love this, man. I, oh, I feel it. Everyone listening, uh, you can search Trevor Carney and just look at that car crash and the fact that he's alive right now telling the story is in and of itself miraculous. And there's no, and I, and I'm glad I tied in for you to tell that nun, what if I was in a car crash Yeah. and all these years later, you're in that same crash with the first out of body experience to say dark, to, true dark delight, true darkness. <laughs> You know what? I'll, 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 I'll expand on that and, and, and I'll leave it at that. Here's a crazy ayahuasca story. So when I was a kid, all I played with was little cars. I loved my little cars all day, every day. I loved it, right? There was one pl place that I had in my house where I used to go along really fast with the cars, you know, and I used to call that place Malibu. And then later, and, and there was a red Ferrari that I had that I used to play with that I regularly would have drove through this little, you know, area called Malibu, you know, as a kid. That, you know, that blew my mind afterwards. The ayahuasca told me that. The ayahuasca said, remember when you were a kid, you used to play in that area and you called it Malibu and you had a little red Ferrari. That blew my mind. 
bro. <laughs> this is so cool. Thank, Thank you for coming on, man. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bro. you so and, much. I look forward to our next. Yeah, one. we'll do. We'll go. <laughs> That's good. You told the base story, so yes. the rest of it starts to make sense, and you yeah. understand moving forward how I'm entwined and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So part one. Part one. Part one. Awesome. Part one. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I told you it was going to be a great story. And brother Trevor, thank you for coming on. I can't wait for our, our future episodes together. And everyone, here's the deal. Trevor has, and you're going to hear more, he has battled and he has gone on. He has become a truther. And for those of you who um, are in this movement, you know what I mean by truther. So his content, has, <laughs> let's just say his content has... Um, what is it polarized him and isolated him and what he's showing and speaking about. And even in this part two, what we're going to get into. So if you feel so inclined, you can uh, support him and what he's doing and the movement that he's doing um, on PayPal. You can find him on PayPal, Trevor Carney, uh, look him up there and support this dear brother. If you feel so inclined and brother Trevor, thank you again for coming on everyone. Thank you for watching. I bless you all with love and light the most high love, the most high light to shine brightly, to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, to love the source of love, to love God and to love one another for in this is all the law and all the prophets. I bless you all brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for watching. I am Lucas Mack. This is the Golden Rule Revolution, and I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for listening. For support in your journey, go to my website, lucasmack.com. <music>